with the start of the new school year, which usually in most churches coincides with the start of lots of different uh, programs or groups that were on hiatus for the summer, we like to spend our Septembers as a church family talking about things that are very important to us ongoing things that really matter to us. They define what we are. Or we talk about things that are becoming important to us. Things that we want to begin to value and live out more and more. Or maybe even timely subjects that fit who we are as a church right now, what we're going through as a church right now, etc. And if you've been with us and we're your church family for any number of years, you can probably think back and remember, oh yeah, that's right. The series name changes, but that's kind of what we do every September. It is part of our rhythm. It is part of our routine as a church family. We're going to do that this year, too. And the title of this four-week series that will occupy all of September is The Short List. And here, on the first week of the short list, we are going to talk about one of those important, essential, timely subjects for us as a church. And I want you to see what the subject is from the pages of Scripture itself. Because it's something that's there, and it's there a lot. But, the more you read the scriptures, the more you've been in church, the more familiar you are with the Bible, the more you're likely to overlook it. So, look with me at some of the letters from your New Testament. These would be things that the first Christian leaders, pastors, passed around to churches that they started all over the eastern Mediterranean world. This is something that Paul writes to a church in ancient Greece. And he says in the first chapter, chapter 10, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. If you were to continue on reading in that letter, you'd find that this particular church was really struggling with the diverse population of people that called it home fighting against one another. And so St. Paul appeals to them to not do that and to be unified. And he does it using a phrase that you also see in this verse. A concept that he repeats, but applies in a very different way. This is one of Paul's later letters, not written to a church, but written to a young pastor named Timothy. And he says, Do not speak harshly to an older man, but speak to him as a father. To younger men, speak to them as brothers. To older women, speak to them as mothers. And to younger women, speak to them as sisters. Which means... You need to do so in absolute purity. Interesting. Timothy's probably a young man here, uh, somewhere in his 20s, maybe his early 30s. And so St. Paul appeals to him and says, hey, when you interact with the young women in your church, make sure you do it in absolute moral purity. Why? Because you need need to treat them like sisters. And I'll bet if they were your actual sisters, that's exactly what you'd do. Look at them no different. Now, different writer, same concept. Here's John, one of the twelve disciples of Jesus, in his biggest and first letter in the New Testament. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not do what is right are not from God, nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. This is pretty common language for John. He speaks in very big black and white terms. And so he tells these people to whom he's writing, here's how you can tell who's with God and who's not. Do they do what's right? Do they love their brothers 
and sisters. So pause with me, and this is, these are three, by the way, of what could be literally dozens of examples from the pages of your New Testament. Pause with me and reach a conclusion as an observer of those three short passages. What exactly is going on there? Three very different passages written by two different people dealing with three very different subjects. What's the commonality? That the first Christians were radically redefining family. Radically. Hear this the way that somebody in that world would have. These are written to people all over the Eastern Roman Empire. For those people, their notion of family was their biological family. Their actual mothers and fathers, grandfathers and grandmothers, children. In fact, in their world, they very likely lived with their extended family. They were all under the same roof. My mother and father would have a son. That son would get married at some point, very likely in his mid to late teens. They would start to have children, and they all live in the same place. And it is to those people that Paul and John and the first Christians say, oh, but let me expand your view here. Let me tell you who your brothers and sisters are. They're the people gathered around you. They're the people who share Jesus with you. They're the people who are not biologically linked to you, but are spiritually linked to you. And again, you have to put yourself in their position. Here you are, a rich merchant in the town of Corinth in Greece. Paul has shown up. He has preached the message and the truth of Jesus. And somehow God gets through to you and you have latched on to the person of Jesus as your own. And so you start to go to this thing called church with all the other people like you who have done the same thing. And then you hear Paul tell you, oh, by the way, treat each other, view each other as kin, as family, as brothers and sisters. And you look around and you realize, wow, I'm sitting next to somebody who's poor. I would have never interacted with that person before. My world was only rich, affluent people. And now the poor guy sitting in the row in front of me, he's my brother, he's my sister. For people in that day, it would have gotten even harder. That rich dude would have looked behind him and seen a slave. And that would have blown his mind to think, Wow, the slave behind me who has no rights and is really viewed in my world more as property than a person. That person is my brother or my sister. Really? Wow. The very religious Jewish person sitting in church would have had to look across the aisle at what's called in your New Testament the Gentile. The very irreligious, unschooled person who believed all kinds of crazy things that the Jewish person would have hated. And they're all there trying to learn about Jesus and follow Him. And the Jew looks across the aisle and hears, hey, guess who your brother is? Guess who your sister is? It's that dude. The guy you had no respect for before you walked in here. Yeah, him. The first Christians were radically redefining family. This is part of what made their movement so powerful. It's part of how they affected so many people. And you think, okay, where'd they dream this up? This kind of crazy, open your arms, we are the world, let's love everybody idea. Where did they get that? Let me take you backward in your Bible. to the first books of your New Testament, to the man himself. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, the last four verses. During Jesus' life and ministry, 
He is speaking to the crowds. And his actual mother Mary and his brothers are standing outside waiting to speak to him. And in the hearing of everybody there, his disciples, those who were intrigued by him, someone says to him, hey, your family's outside. They want to talk to you. And Jesus replies, who's my mother? Who's my brother? And pointing to his followers, he said, here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of my heavenly father is my brother, my sister, and my mother. You want to know where they got the idea? They got it from the man himself. What do you think Jesus was trying to say? That oftentimes, we can have more in common. We can have a closer kinship and intimacy with people who are not our blood, but share our faith. Who do not share our biology, but, sp- but share our spirituality. This is the insight that Jesus had. Have you ever experienced that for yourself? I'll bet you there are people in the room who have. Who have found that just because somebody bears the name father or son or uncle, they cannot be trusted. And if they have a recalcitrant, stubborn heart, they can hurt you deeply. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, you're not bound by biology. You will find among those like you who follow Jesus a family that you can count on. A family you didn't know you had. Who are united in trying to follow God and His will along with you. And apparently in Jesus' view, that is more trustworthy than blood. Wow. Ain't that something. So I think, for those of us who are gathered here this morning, for those of us who say about ourselves that we are Christians and we want to walk in the footsteps of the forefathers of our faith, we have to pause and we have to ask, hmm, how do we do this? Maybe you're like me and you grew up in a... uh, Christian tradition, a church tradition where it was fairly common to call people by the label brother and sister. Oh, there's Brother Cliff. Oh, there's Sister Eunice. Oh, there's Brother Jim. Yes, people are named Eunice. (laughs) What? Is it weird that that's the name that came to my head? Okay. Okay. (laughs) You're not going to remember anything about today? Except Eunice. I know. I know. Right? It's fairly common in some Christian circles to call each other by that label. But we have to pause and think, okay, do we mean that the way that our forefathers in the faith meant that? Do we hear that the way they would have heard that as a radical redefinition of who our family is? So really, the place we have to start this morning is all of us have to ask for ourselves, are we willing to be stretched in this way? Because sometimes, maybe you're like me, it is very easy to feel like the safest thing I can do in life is to just focus on my wife and my two kids. Because they're the only safe people I got. And I love them to death. More now than I ever have. And it's really easy for me to get tied up in the needs of my kids. Going to football games with my son. Taking my daughter to band practice. And to think that all those things that are part of my family, my biological family's life, are really the extent of where my time and my energy and my love need to go. Sometimes it even seems like the way that we as Americans live encourages me to think that all I really have time for are the people who live with me under the roof of my house on Timber Lane in Granville. You feel that too sometimes? 
it seems as if we have to start by saying, yeah, we're willing to take the same risk that those first Christians would have had to take. We are willing to have our eyes opened and widened. And I am willing to say that I am going to treat all of you who call our church home like I would treat my son or my daughter. Like I would treat my brother Richard or my sister Sarah. And it doesn't mean necessarily that you can do for everybody what you do for your actual spouse or your actual child. No. To love well sometimes means you have to focus in on just a few people. Maybe some of the people here aren't going to be like your brothers or sisters, your mothers or fathers. They're going to be like your cousins or your nephews, your uncle, your aunt. But they're family nonetheless. Are you willing to have your definition of who your family is expanded? I suspect when you heard me talk about those verses and how the people in the first century world would have heard them, you heard the sheer audacity of the idea. The idealism and the power of the idea. No, we are not limited to the family into which we are born. God has something far greater in mind, which is the family of God that is not bound by your biology. Are you willing to take the risk to expand? Maybe even just a little bit, because that's how most growth happens. It happens slowly over time. Are you willing to take the risk of expanding who you think your family is and who you can really trust? I hope so. Now, as we continue to think about this and mull this over and take it as seriously as those first Christians would want us to take it, here's something that those of us who call River Tree Home need to recognize. We're already pretty good at this. This is not a foreign concept to you. In fact, Many of you who call our church home would do so because you feel like it is your family. You have friends here that you would lie down and traffic for, and they would do the same for you. You have friends here you would sacrifice for, and they would do the same for you. You have friends here that you enjoy every bit as much as you enjoy your husband's company or your kid's company. That's why you're here. That's what God's trying to do everywhere, in every part of the world, at all times in human history, when Christians gather like this. You're already pretty good at it. You realize that? This is something that we need to pay attention to. This is something that we need to cultivate here. Not lose sight of. Is it your family? And see, it's very easy in a church of our size, which is the normal church size in America, 75% of all churches in America have under 150 people who attend. It's very easy for churches like that, who are in the large majority, to think there's a lot wrong with them. In fact, um, oftentimes, the great Christian marketing and media machine that exists will have them think that. Because they are not large. They do not have a big building. They don't have a lot of programs. They don't have a lot of paid staff. And all of a sudden, this vast majority of churches feels like they're the ugly stepkid in the kingdom of God in America. Uh, allow me to flip that for you. If 75% of all churches are 150 people or less, less, maybe there's something right with it. Not something wrong with it. Maybe it's because when you're that size, you can actually know people. Maybe it's because when you're that size, you can begin to create 
this large spiritual family that the first Christians envisioned. If you've ever been a part of a large or even medium-sized church, you know there's all kinds of great things about a church of that size. And you will invariably have recognized for yourself one of the weaknesses, which is it's hard for it to be your family. You feel sometimes on Sunday morning like you're showing up and somebody ought to sell you a ticket and a barrel of popcorn because there is no difference between that and going to the movies. Yeah, you do this well, River Tree. It is an extraordinary strength that you have. Many of us have been willing to take the risk of expanding who we think family is. And we have decided to treat each other that way. That's so much of what our neighbor talk is about, right? Yeah. We need to pay attention to this and accentuate it. If we are each other's family, you know how it works in family. You have to spend time together. It doesn't just happen miraculously. I am the father of a soon-to-be teenage girl. Pray for me now. What I often recognize is that if I'm not careful and intentional, I am not spending enough face time, enough talk time with my soon-to-be 13-year-old. And she being the 12 and a half year old that she is she doesn't seek me out she seeks me out to laugh and to joke around and whatnot but for those important conversations or for those check-ins to make sure she's doing okay she won't seek me out for that i have to seek her out for that because she's my family that's part of how it works i care about that quality time with her with my son with my wife Family really only becomes a word if you lose that, right? You simply become a group of people who pay each other's bills if you lose that relational intimacy and connection. Well, see, it's no different if we are going to allow ourselves to expand our definition of family to what the first Christians and, yes, Jesus Himself envisioned. If you don't want the idea of somebody being your brother or sister to be only merely words, then you're going to have to be intentional about it. Even in a church of this size, it is so easy to show up, get coffee, say hi to somebody, listen, sing, pray, and then go. And that is not family. Right? So what I would encourage you to do is to be intentional about family here. You know that we're starting up all kinds of small groups right now. That's really where family happens. This is where we can encourage it. This is where we can talk about it like we are this morning. But really, if you want to have brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers in the faith, who are deeply tied to you and you to them, who invest in each other and support each other, You've got to get together beyond this. And you have to be purposeful and deliberate about it. So, check out the list of small groups. There's one back there on the back table, uh, at the back of the worship area. Pick one that works for you. Let me help you get involved. For us to be family, it takes that. Maybe you've also, as you're thinking it through and using the image of family, and applying it to church. Maybe you landed on this. In order for us to do this, to really be family, that means we all have to take responsibility for the family. I'm sure that in your home, just like in mine, we have a list of chores. Things that just have to get done. And what we try to do is we try to pick, everybody picks the thing that they like to do the most or they're the best at. So, for instance, I do most of the cooking in my house because I like to cook. And nobody else in my house really does, so it's something that I do. I grocery shop and I cook and I love it. Um, I do not fold laundry because it boggles my mind why you would fold underwear. I do not understand. Do you know where that goes? Why would you fold it? Why would you bother to fold it? I get it why I would fold this. 
I don't get why you get my point. Okay? <laughs> I don't do the laundry in my house because some other people in my house have the expectation that every single solitary article of clothing, including socks, has to be neatly folded. I'm out. I am not your guy for that. So somebody else does it. And then, of course, there are the chores in our house that nobody wants to do. Uh, if in the Shearer household, that would be weeding. None of us, myself, my wife, my two darling children, like to weed. Which means that we just all suck it up on occasion and do it anyway. And you know what? That's kind of how it is in church life, too. There's a to-do list around here. In fact, it's on your chairs this morning. To be a part of a church family means you are willing to take responsibility for the family. To do your part. If you don't have a part that you are playing in the family, read that list over. Find something that you are willing to do. A couple of things you are willing to do. Help the family out. You can return that to me or back to the, the blue baskets on the back of the table at the back of the worship area. But for us to be a family, we have to function like a family, and that's part of it. Last, and I think this is important, not that the rest of it hasn't been, but it would be easy to miss the connection here. So we've talked this morning about this wonderful, vibrant, countercultural idea of expanding our definition of family, and that really it was woven into the fabric of the faith we claim from the very outset. We just may have missed it a little bit. Or we have just uh, ignored it or overlooked it for a while. Um, here's the thing about family. How do you suppose those first Christians saw their movement take off like wildfire across the known, known world? Right? Um, this whole Jesus thing started with one guy and a very small set of disciples, followers. Twelve who were really committed, but in the end, at his crucifixion, weren't committed at all. And then perhaps a hundred or more who were even more loosely committed than that. And from that, in one generation, 40, 50 years, you have Christianity all over the known world. How on earth did that happen? You wouldn't have thought it was gonna. Well, part of how it happened is family. Everywhere the first disciples of Jesus went, they taught about Jesus. His view of things. What He wanted us to believe. Who He wanted us to be. And as people latched on to that, part of what they latched on to is, oh wow, I have been living my life with far too narrow a view of who my family are. And actually my family are these people that I didn't know before Jesus. Who are very different from me, culturally, socioeconomically. They're my family. And the world watched. And the world couldn't make heads or tails of it. Why would you do that? Why would you embrace and love people and give to people and sacrifice to people who are not your blood? Why would you do that? The world around them, their jaws dropped. They didn't understand. They were dumbfounded by what was transpiring. And yet, like a magnet, it was attractive. And the watching world said, before now, I never knew that that was possible. I did not know that we could have that. And I want it. And so, the ripples began to expand out. And simply by God's people, among other things, choosing to live like a family, all of a sudden Christianity takes off. 
you realize, right, River Tree, that is how you will reach people? You are not going to reach people because we put on the best product on Sunday morning. You are not going to reach people because you have the best teaching pastor on Sunday morning. You are not going to reach people because we have the best literature or the best website or the best kids program. No. You're going to reach people because we invite them into the family. And they have felt disengaged. They've been lonely or broken. Or they just wanted more than the silo existence of the typical American. And they find it in you. And then you know what they get to do? They get to offer that along with us to other people too. That's the magic of neighborly love. You're my neighbor. I'm going to love you. Now come join me in the effort to love other neighbors too. You see it? That's how you'll reach people. That's how you'll change people. One life at a time. Let me finish today with this. You see that quote up there on the screen? This is really a great synopsis of what those first Christians were driving at. When they told the first followers of Jesus to expand their definition of family, and that in order to be Christians, they could not keep it confined to mere biology. The quote simply reads, Family is not always blood. It's the people in your life who want you in theirs. The ones who accept you for who you are. The ones who would do anything to see you smile. And who love you no matter what. Hmm. I bet that's what Paul and John and Jesus were trying to create. A group of people committed to that. By the way, since we're at the end, um, let me just pass on this little tidbit. You want to know how to radically transform your biological family? Your relationship with your spouse? Your relationship with your kids? Treat them like they're your spiritual family. Start by treating them the way you know Scripture and Jesus tell you to treat other people. You want to know the greatest parenting advice I can give you? It's not a book. It's not love and logic. It's treat your kids the way the Bible says you're supposed to treat people. Want to change your marriage? You don't need to go to a seminar. At least not first. Treat your wife or your husband the way you're supposed to treat people. It will change your biological family if you just treat them like they're part of your spiritual family. As you personally consider this... Uh, really extraordinary redefinition of family among the first Christians. Let me give you a chance here at the end of the message to pause for a moment and have a little face time with God. All you've got to do is be quiet. You can use those questions up on the screen as prompts if you like. Um, but just allow God to remind you or tell you what He wants you to take from what you heard this morning. And tell him that you are willing to use it. You're, gonna, you're not just going to let this be another Sunday sermon that you heard, but you are going to take this and you're actually going to begin to put it into practice in your life, even if just a little bit at a time. Would you pause in the quiet, spend a moment or two with God, and then I will pray for us all.